Um, welcome everyone to the NCAR EOL seminar. Um, today's speaker is Dr. Christina Archer. Christina is a professor in the College of Earth, Ocean and Environment at the University of Delaware, where she has a joint appointment between the Physical Ocean Science and Engineering Program and Department of Geography and Spatial Sciences. She is uh, the Associate Director of the Center for Research in Wind, which focuses on wind energy and in particular on offshore and its integration in the electric grid. Um, Christina received her PhD in Civil and Environmental Engineering from Stanford University in 2004. And she held a postdoc position there um, from 2004 to 2005 and then worked as an atmospheric modeler in the Air Quality District of San Francisco. Dr. Archer joined the Carnegie Institution for Science in 2007 as a research associate. And she was an assistant professor in the Department of Geological and Environmental Sciences of the California State University, Chico, 2008 to 2011. She then joined the University of Delaware in 2011. Um, and she's still there now. Um, her research interests include wind power, meteorology, air quality, climate change, and numerical modeling. And we are actually very grateful that she could still join today because she is literally in the middle of a hurricane. And so we are very grateful you could still make it. Um, before we get started, I would like to remind everyone that um, if you would like to ask Dr. Archer a question, please send the question to me via email. You can find my email address in the flyer that was sent out and also in the calendar invite. So please, please ask questions. And with that, I'll pass it on to you, Christina. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope that you guys can hear me well. Uh, give me the thumbs up. Okay, yeah, <laughs> excellent. Um, the the uh, I'm actually very happy to be talking to you, although I was supposed to be actually at NCOR. I was invited to be there in person, so I'm actually very sad that I'm not there uh, with you guys in person. But at the same time, uh, there was a hurricane here today. And so if you'll allow me, since we are all meteorology nerds here, I want to share actually a video that uh, uh, we just took uh, not too long ago. Uh, my husband actually and my daughter did and so let's see if I can figure out how to show you my video. Uh, here we go. This was taken literally uh, four hours ago. Are you ready? This is a little creek in my neighborhood with a little walking bridge and the creek has become this. And a big tree hits the bridge, causes a local flooding. You can see the railings of the, of the bridge with orange paint on it. This was uh, literally six hours ago. And And then I want to show you what actually happened a few hour, a few hours, uh, an hour later. Um, this is about an hour later and it's the entire neighborhood neighborhood is flooded the little the bridge that the the, um, the the orange railings that I showed earlier are here I hope you can see what I'm pointing at there's like three feet of water in the entire neighborhood so I was really afraid that I wasn't going to be able to make it to, to this talk, but uh, fortunately, yes, and we, we haven't even lost power, so that's good. So after this introduction, let's actually go back to the real stuff, to my PowerPoint presentation. And I'm going to actually play kind of like a detective role in a sense. Um, I want to talk to you about this complex story of how wind turbines actually affect the lower boundary layer. And it's actually truly a detective story. And, uh, and I'll, I'll actually share it with you almost step by step because it's been a journey for uh, some five years or, or even more at this point. Um, it all started a few years ago when there were these absurd 
crazy claims that uh, wind farms were actually causing global warming. And it wasn't just one article, it was actually multiple of them. Climatic effects uh, um, similar to a doubling of atmospheric CO2 due to wind power. And even in 2018, wild, wide, wide scale US wind power could cause significant warming. This is, this is kind of like serious. And uh, it, it's, it's also, kind of wrong if you think about it. Turbines don't, uh, don't combust anything, don't emit any heat. If anything, they mix properties. So, you know, if you're just mixing, you can't create any net heating or any warming. If, if anything, there's some frictional dissipation that they may cause, but it's actually been proven to be, to be very, very insignificant. So what's going on? At the same time, there was one uh, mechanism that was blamed for the reason for this potential warming, and that is vertical mixing, enhanced vertical mixing by the turbines. And there are many, many uh, studies that uh, suggest that vertical mixing as the reason for these uh, impacts at the surface. We're going to 2004, 2011, 2010, and even more recently in 2016, again, increased vertical mixing as this very important mechanism by which the surface properties are impacted by turbines. So, um, where, where did it all started? And uh, I, uh, it actually really started with this field campaign in 1989, which was conducted in San Gorgonio. San Gorgonio is this very old farm, actually, one of the earliest farms in the US. At that time, it, was, uh, um, uh, it consisted of very short turbines that were 23 meters tall only. And they were arranged in this region over 41 rows. And they're near Palm Springs, which is uh, Palm Springs, which is here in the in the lower right corner. Uh, Enrel conducted this study study um, because they had two towers, an upwind tower and a downwind tower, with the farm in between, and they were able to measure temperature and other properties actually upwind versus downwind. The flow here is generally west to east or, nor or west nor northwesterly uh, from the Pacific Ocean, let's say, towards the, uh, the desert area uh, of Palm Springs. And so that's why upwind is, is on the west side and downwind is kind of like on the east side. And uh, uh, let me show you some of the findings that they, they reported. Um, so this is a plot of temperature as a function of time after this month long campaign that was conducted, maybe two months long campaign that was conducted. And it shows you the different readings near the surface for the upwind tower with the green dot, with the green circles and the downwind tower. And you can see that uh, according to this figure at the downwind tower, the temperature is colder, it's cooler. I mean, we're talking about 38 degrees at the upwind tower in the afternoon, and we're talking about four degrees cooler at the downwind tower. And vice versa, at nighttime, the difference between the two towers is actually flip sign. So it looks like the tower that is upwind is slightly warmer than the tower that is downwind. And the uh, justification, again, came from enhanced vertical mixing. If you think about the, the typical unstable super adiabatic profile that happens in the summertime, you have very, very hot surface temperature, decreasing temperature with height. So if you enhance the mixing, you might be able to bring the cooler air from aloft down to the surface and thus cool, cool the surface temperatures downwind. And that, that is the explanation provided for this cooling. And vice versa, at night, you might have a cooler surface and so if you enhance the mixing, you can bring slightly warmer air from aloft down to the surface in the presence of the turbines and thus cool the, uh, excuse me, warm the surface temperature a little bit. So that was the idea. So here's where the de detective story starts, right? So let's take a look at what actually happens between the 50 meter, which is the highest level of the tower, and the five meter level of the tower. So this tower was actually relatively high. And so it turns out that uh, uh, if you look at the uh, figure here in the upper, uh, you guys can see what I'm pointing at with the mouse. Okay. At the uh, downwind tower, th this is the difference up downwind, excuse me, 50 meters minus five meters. So in the middle of the afternoon, the difference is negative. 
meaning that uh, it's colder at 50 meters than it is at five meters, as we would expect in the summertime because it's so unstable. But look at the magnitude of this difference. So the top of, of the tower is only one and a half degrees warmer than the bottom of the tower. So you have to explain to me how it's possible to cool something by four degrees with air that is only one and a half degrees colder. It just doesn't, there's no mechanism that I can think of by which the, the upper level of the tower at 50 meters is one and a half degrees colder. For some reason, I mix that air down. And by the way, as soon as I bring air down adiabatically, I actually warm it. So that one and a half degrees colder air cannot possibly cool my downwind uh, tower by four degrees or three degrees. So that, that, that was one of the inconsistencies. And similarly, actually, if you look at some vertical profiles that I'm showing down here, where the uh, yellow line is actually the uh, 50 meter height of the tower, you can see that similarly, actually almost the opposite story happens at night when you should actually see more warming if this is what was going on because of the adiabatic profile that I was saying. So if you're actually bringing down warmer air from, from the 50 meter tower, then it should warm up more than this tiny, tiny 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 degrees that actually was observed. So this seemed a little bit strange. Um, so it turns out that, uh, you remember there were some stripes uh, in the farm that I showed here, um, these, these you know, dark gray strips of some sort, and it was unclear what it was. It turns out that those are ponds. Ponds of water, they're called aquifer refilling ponds that are filled and every time there's, uh, there's any excess water or any time the district uh, decides to, to do this, they try to refill the aquifer uh, exactly in these ponds. And so the cooling at the downwind tower was not caused by the turbines mixing these colder air from aloft, which mysteriously is not cold enough, but it's simply due to the fact that there are water ponds. So the air that, that is advected over the, over the farm and over the ponds is cooled by the presence of the water. You can go to Google Maps today and uh, look, look for these features and you will see that there's still water today. So this, the, it depends how much water there is, depends on the year and the precipitation, etc. And so this is uh, uh, possibly, this is almost all full of water. So it may have been in the spring after rain. Anyway, there's generally a, uh, uh, you know, there are generally these ponds at, at this farm. In addition, you don't have to take my word for it. There's actually a study, another study that was uh, looking at this farm using satellite images from uh, Landsat, I believe. And these three figures that I'm showing you are taken from that region. And guess what? The square is exactly over the uh, San Gorgonio farm. And you can probably recognize that very typical uh, fan shape of that farm. And the temperature there, if you look at the scale, is something like eight to even, um, even 10 degrees colder than the surrounding air, precisely due to the presence of that water. So if there's any cooling that was observed at the downwind tower, that was not due to the, to the farms. Maybe something was going on with the farm as well, but definitely the strongest uh, signal of all was due to these, these water ponds. So that was the first time that I was starting to kind of doubt uh, this idea of, of the mixing. Um, so here's a collection of a bunch of studies that have been published since then. Uh, they have been collected in this paper, not by myself, but Miller and Keith in Jules 2018. And they did this very thorough review of all the studies based on satellite information as well as ground measurements. And you don't have to look at all the details or, or you know, you, you can if you want. In general, the message that I, I, I could see was that of warming. So, you know, these claims of global warming, they were a little crazy, but at the same time, most of these measuring campaigns seem to find some sort of a warming signal, especially associated with uh, stable conditions at night. However, at this, which, which seems to support the idea of this enhanced vertical mixing. At the same time, I circle here in red, uh, some cases where it just didn't make sense because this was warming that was actually observed during the day or it was observed when the stability is not supposed to be stable. For example, June, July, August during the day, 
how can you get warming again? Uh, you know, there should be cooling, if anything, if there's an, a super adiabatic profile, even if we know that the, this isn't, didn't work at San Gorgonio, there should be cooling, not warming, if there's enhanced vertical mixing. So even though warming seems to be most likely, it's actually so much more likely that it seems to also happen in unstable conditions. So this story of enhanced vertical mixing just doesn't seem very, very convincing. Um, one of the few campaigns that actually tried to really look at what's happening in a farm was the CWEX, CWEX, CWEX campaigns in 2010 and, and the year later in 2011. And this was a fantastic campaign that collected a lot of data and in particular also collected data on turbulence kinetic energy upstream versus downstream of turbines as well as temperature. Let me tell you a couple of things about this campaign because the setup is actually kind of important. Um, you can see down here, there's a row of B1, B2, B3. These are turbines uh, in this uh, Iowa farm that are lined up, as you can see. They're about five diameters from each other. And there's a second line, A1, A2, A3, further in the farm. And they mounted a bunch of uh, flux stations and, and a lot of sensors, actually, at several sites. I'm going to point out a couple of them. NLAE, NLA1. This is considered the upstream site, and it's about three diameters from the three to four diameters from the turbines. Then there's NLA2, which is right behind the turbines, very, very close. This is a very, uh, it's, it's called near wake uh, measurement. And then the more interesting one, NLA3, which is called like far wake. It's something like uh, maybe 10 diameters from, from the farms. And the four is also uh, far downstream, but at this point, it's also affected by the second row of turbines. So I, 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 it's hard to say whether it's really, you know, far away from B4 or it's like a, some kind of an intermediate distance from, from turbines, the, the row A. Anyway, the directions of interest, which are called wake directions, were southerly and southeasterly when uh, obviously NL1 was upstream and uh, the known wake direction, which was the reference for this, the control case against which to compare anything, was actually a westerly flow. And I think this is a little bit of the problem with this campaign. The fact that the control case, the known wake direction, was actually not the same as the, as the wake direction. So you're comparing what happens from during southwest, south, southerly flow with what actually happens under westerly flow and not at the same time. Um, and so this, this is a little bit of a reason why some inconsistencies actually were found. Um, I'm sorry, I had actually circles to highlight these, these, these stations. And uh, I also want to point out that there's a little bit of uh, informed variability in terms of the land use. You can see that there are brown areas, dark green, there were crops and uh, crops grew at different rates uh, throughout the campaign. Uh, and so it wasn't super homogeneous. So let me show you some of the results that they found. And uh, the, the, you have to bear with me here because I kind of have to show you some numbers in, in, in a little bit of detail. So these are measurements of turbulent kinetic energy. So turbulent kinetic energy, actually it's the change of turbulent kinetic energy with respect to a control case. So if, if a turbine enhances mixing and is turbulent, then turbulent kinetic energy is supposed to be higher in the wake of the turbine. So let me show you what happens, for example, under stable conditions. So the, the stable conditions here, this is the no wake condition. It's the control case. This is normality in the absence of any kind of wakes. And then we have the two conditions of the wake, uh, B2 when it's southwest and B, B2, B3 when it's south, so southwest. And I'm going to focus on the far wake site, which is NLA3. So the difference between NLA3, which is downwind, and NLA1, which is upstream. So if you look at what happens, for example, here during the wake event, uh, during the wake events of B2, the difference in TKE is plus 1.89 normalized, which basically means that the site downstream, NLA3, has more turbulent kinetic energy than the site upstream. Thus, the difference is positive and it's 1.89. So you might think based on this that, uh, oh, okay, the turbines do increase turbulent kinetic energy. And I'm gonna have to say you wear the scientist hat 
because in order to, to be able to conclude that, you have to make sure you have to compare against what happens under normal conditions in the absence of any wake. And that's what this value here tells us, 0 0.39, which basically means that even under normal conditions, site actually at NLA3 has more turbulent kinetic energy just by background than the site at NLA1. However, when you do the difference between the two, that's truly the, fact, the fraction of TKE that, that is attributable to the, the turbines themselves. And that is positive. So indeed, it seems that the turbines do increase turbulent kinetic energy in this case, in the stable case. And I checked, you can check also, it's the same story for the, uh, for the other direction, the, the more uh, southerly direction. And it also was the same for the far wake site and the four. So this one would be like, yes, green, check, it's consistent with enhanced vertical mixing because turbulent kinetic energy is higher indeed downstream of the turbines than it is upstream. But then I'm gonna say, okay, let's keep looking at this table in more detail. And all of a sudden, if you look at what happens in unstable conditions, you actually see the exact opposite. So for example, here uh, in this case, the, the difference between the two sites is negative. So it's reduced, the, the, the turbulent kinetic energy downstream is less than upstream in the presence of a wake. And guess what? In the control case, it was actually the other way around. So as if the wake actually reduces the turbulent kinetic energy at the downstream site, the difference here is negative, which means that the, the wake causes a reduction in TKE, not an increase. And it happens actually in a bunch of cases here highlighted in red. Um, so also for neutral conditions, same story, D TKE is actually decreased. So now we're like the detective story, he gets more and more complicated, right? So not only do we get some inconsistencies in the first study that was ever published because of the ponds, uh, we see temperature having a strange behavior. Most of the time it's warmer, even in unstable conditions. And then this, this enhanced uh, vertical mixing doesn't really seem to happen all the time, not even uh, at, uh, at the seaway something. Let's take a look at mo what modeling says. So I looked at some wind tunnel experiments that uh, were done by uh, Chamorro and Porteagel, published in Bandulayer Meteorology, and they looked at neutral and stable conditions. So these are wind tunnel experiments, so it's not, uh, it's not in the real boundary layer, but these are measurements, not simulations. Uh, sorry, I mentioned uh, modeling studies, they're coming next. So this is a wind tunnel uh, measurement, measuring experiment. And uh, as you can see here, I don't have exactly TKE. I have some sort of a uh, turbulence intensity, sigma u divided by hub height speed. But as you can see, if the turbine is here and the flow is from left to right, I do have indeed very high turbulence in the upper part of the, of the rotor area. Here, in the, above hub height, that's the maximum generation. There's a lot of shear going on there, a lot of TKE. But look at what happens below, below in the lower part of the rotor, even in the surface. You see the color is light blue and upstream, the color was yellow. This means that it seems that the kinet turbulent kinetic energy is actually reduced below the wake, not enhanced. And if you go in stable conditions, even more, this is now dark blue, whereas upstream in the same region, you could see light blue, green, and even yellow. This suggests that it's actually, re there's a reduction in turbulence, not an enhancement. Um, this is another study by, by uh, Tian et al. And they're looking at vertical profile of turbulence intensity. And you can see the same story. The inflow conditions are the green line. And then after the turbine, the profiles have this uh, typical S shape, which indicates increased turbulence in the upper part of the rotor, but guess what? Reduced turbulence below hub height and below the rotor in a couple of cases. Then we can look at modeling results. And uh, these are results by my former student, student uh, Shengbai Xie. And he developed his own uh, large eddy simulator with a uh, actuator line model to look at uh, what happens downstream of a turbine. And again, here we can, say, we can see the same story. It doesn't look like the wake hits the ground. It just doesn't seem like the turbulence of the wake is able to actually connect or to touch, uh, to touch the ground. 
um, I can also show you here some uh, um, results by uh, Lou and Portea Gal. These are indeed simulations, and it's the same story. There is the undisturbed profile upstream, which is the solid black line. And then no matter what, downstream, you always see a reduction of DKE below the rotor. These are firm, former, uh, excuse me, have further results uh, by my, my team. And now we looked at stable, neutral, and unstable conditions. These are, uh, again, uh, TKE uh, uh, at, at various distances downstream of a turbine. And no matter what, no matter what the stability is, it looks like below the rotor, there's no enhancement. So this is what basically motivates the interest that I have and uh, the field campaign that I was actually able to conduct thanks to NCAR uh, uh, Earth Observing System and the National Science Foundation. What we did was, how about we go measure this stuff and have really vertical mixing as the main focus of the campaign. We wanna measure anything and everything that has to do with mixing downstream of a turbine. And we happen to have a turbine at the University of Delaware so uh, Newark here in Delaware, this is where my university is, the University of Delaware. We are so close to uh, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey that if you drive around in a circle of 20 miles, you basically hit four states. Welcome to the East Coast. <laughs> and about an hour and a half south, you go to the beautiful Delaware beaches, especially Lewis and Rehoboth, white sand beaches. I'm not kidding you. This is a Google um, satellite. Um, photo and this is Cape and Lopen, you know, white beach, beautiful, beautiful. And uh, our turbine is our, so here's the Lewis campus, which is part of the uh, University of Delaware. And here is our two megawatt uh, Siemens, actually, it's a Gamesa turbine. Gamesa now has become Siemens Gamesa, but this is a Gamesa turbine, two megawatt, 80 meters hub height, and 93 meter diameter for, for the turbine. It's a single turbine. This is a photo actually of it. And uh, uh, it's located basically in a marsh. And oops. And I'm gonna show you here the layout of the, of the campaign. The ocean is actually up here in the upper right corner. You can see it here. And the turbine is located here where the X is. There's actually a little bit of a hint of the, of the shadow of the turbine in this, in this uh, photo. And we, we had uh, a um, um, MET tower here. It was pre-existing. It was 49 meters high. And we equipped it uh, with five levels of sonic anemometers on one side and uh, uh, temperature sensors on the other side of these, these arms. We had uh, two LIDARs, even though LIDAR number two kept having problems, so basically it was useless. So LIDAR number one is the one that we care the most about. It's located at the Coast Guard site, and uh, it, it basically points into the marsh. This is a huge marsh where we placed all these sensors, um, the surface flux stations. We have 15 of them. And we placed a bunch of them, uh, S1, S2, and S3 are the ones that I'll be talking about the most. These are about 6D, it's the distance of interest. If there's any touchdown of the, of the wake, it should happen before uh, or, or at six diameters. And then we have a bunch of wakes in the further, in the, in the far wake to see if there's any touchdown past that. And then S15 is more like a reference station uh, that we used. What else? Um, oh yeah, I'm showing you here the typical wind rows of the um, fall in, excuse me, in September. The campaign started at the end of August and uh, August, September, October of 2016. And uh, the typical direction for that time is indeed from the Northeast. And so from the Northeast, the idea is that the flow hits the turbine, the wake then develops over the marsh and eventually hits some of these sites. And the sites are equipped, as you can see here, there's a photo. They have a sonic anemometer at 10 meters and then another one at three meters. But the one at 10 meters is 3D and the one at two meters is not. And then we have a temperature sensor at two and a half meters. And these was, were scattered, as you can see in, in the marsh. And the idea was that hopefully when a wake hits one of those sites, it does not hit a nearby site. So we always have one site that is affected by the wake and a pair in sight that is not affected by the wake. So we can do these differences and differences to detect the effect. So 
We had a bunch of cases. This is one of them, which was particularly well documented with the LIDARs. It was a neutral case in September on September 20th. The turbine is here, and this is actually um, uh, horizontal wind speed. And uh, we have a detection, a wake detection algorithm that, that tries to identify the center of the wake as well as the width of the wake. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, so the best we could do is shown here. So you can see the wake here, for example, in this case, uh, the wake hits site S5, but site S1 is right outside of the wake and also site S4 is not in the wake. So a good comparison between, would be between let's say S5 and S4 or S5 and S1. And then the wake moves and uh, now it hits, let's say site S2 and S3, but again, not S1 et cetera, et cetera. So this is just to give you the idea that these wakes are actually rather complicated. They're not conical or beautifully uh, geometric features. They're very messy. They're meandering around. They're affected by all kinds of turbulent, turbulence, turbulent eddies, uh, surface features, um, uh, anything. Uh, and also, even though the wind direction didn't change a lot during this case, it was generally, again, from the Northeast, um, still sometimes it's, it's not always the same site that remains under the wake, basically. And uh, so let's take a look at some of these measurements of, of these sites. So uh, this is a lot of stuff in here, but I'm hoping that I will be able to explain it to you relatively quickly. Let's focus on the left figure. This is heat flux, W prime, T prime. And we're looking at a case, the, the 20th, 20th of September case. There were, there were actually two wake events at, uh, at, uh, that we looked at. Uh, one that occurred at 1.30 and one that occurred an hour later it, at 2.30. But again, we needed to identify a period where none of the sites that were affected was actually under the wake. And that's what we, what we call a control site or a control period. So, it's always important that you compare the properties under the wake versus the property during the control where none of the sites was under the wake. And the difficulty was to identify actually these control periods because uh, the wake is turbulent, it goes, it keeps moving. And uh, we wanna make sure that the stability is the same, that the wind conditions are the same, that everything is the same as much as possible, but none of the site is under the wake. So we have a very good comparison. So if you look at heat flux, there's nothing interesting to report. As you can see, it was very neutral and uh, the wake didn't impact the heat flux whatsoever. Site S2, S, excuse me, S1, S3, S13, you name it, they're all the same. It's very, very uninteresting. But if we look at TKE now, uh, the, the figure here in the upper right, then let me, let me walk you through it. So, um, when the, the, during the control case, again, neither S1 nor S3 are under the wake. None of them is under the wake. And their TKE, in fact, is very similar. The two lines are almost on top of each other. Then guess what? The wake now actually hits site S3. So S3 is now under the wake. S3 is under the wake in the gray period. And look at what happens. The TKE is reduced with respect to the TKE at S1, which is uh, the site that is not under the wake in this case. And then the wake is over, there's some kind of oscillation between the two, and the wake hits again, hits S3 again. And what happens again is that S1 remains at, at the same TKE, and S3 actually has less TKE. So in both of these two wake events, with respect to the control case where the two sites had the same TKE, what happened was that the site under the wake, S3, had lower TKE than the site that was not under the wake. And the same story happened for some other vertical fluxes, U prime, W prime. Again, the two sites are uh, on top of each other, are very similar in the control uh, period. And then when the wake hits S3, the, the black line goes below the red line and does the same thing during the second wake event. And when we look at V prime, W prime, it's the same story. We had a bunch of cases like this, as you can imagine. I'm showing you now some kind of a, a conglomerate of, of a lot of these cases. I have change in wind speed at the, at the site, and I also have change in friction velocity U star on the right. 
And the way you read this again is, this is a difference between the speed at uh, the site under the wake, in this case S2, and uh, uh, the site that was not under the wake. So the green line here is the direction under which none of the sites was under the wake. And in fact, the difference in speed that they observed was around zero. They were experiencing more or less the same speed for all the stability conditions, stable, neutral, or unstable. And then the wind changes from zero to 20 to 40. Now in this um, pink, pink zone, I guess, this is where S2 is actually under the wake. And when S2 is under the wake, what happens is that its speed goes down. And it goes down significantly, and it goes down under all stabilities. Which means that when the wake hits site S2, there is indeed a wind speed deficit that impacts the site. And the wind speed deficit already reaches the ground at the distance of S2. So the wake, if you think of the wake as a wind speed deficit, yes, it, it, it hits the ground. But if you think of the wake as enhanced turbulence or turbulence, it, just the turbulence, we can look at U star, which is a very good representation of turbulence, especially in the vertical. If you look at TKE alone, actually I forgot to mention that it tends to be dominated by the fluctuations in the horizontal speed. Whereas if you look at U star, now you can emphasize more what's happening in the vertical because it has, is more sensitive to W prime, has a V prime, W prime, and U prime, W prime. And you can see that here, what happens is actually a reduction in friction velocity at S2. So at S2, when the wake hits, the speed is decreased and so is the turbulence. So uh, now I'm trying to show you a summary of vertex that looks kind of like what the CUX campaign was. So I have a table where I'm comparing now the speed observed at, at, uh, at the site of interest, at the various sites of interest under no wake conditions in the first uh, row, and then the wake conditions in the second row. And we have stable neutral and unstable conditions and a bunch of sites, S2 minus S1 and S3 minus S1 are in the nearest uh, wake region, the first circle that I showed you. And then S10 and S11 are a little further down. Let me show you the map again, oops. So S1 and S2 and S3 are here. I'm doing S2 minus S1 and S3 minus S1 for directions where these two are under the wake and S1 is not. And then we had S11 and S10 versus S7. And um, again, we have to do the same difference in differences. We have to be careful. So if you look at when the wake hits S2 and you look at the difference between the two sites, you get a negative value, minus 0 0.127 normalized. And you might be thinking, oh yeah, the speed is decreasing because this, this value is negative. So S2 has lower speed than S1, it's due to the turbine. And I'm gonna say, wait a second, you have to, con you have to make sure that that's, uh, that's not uh, some kind of a exceptional behavior. So you, have to, you check with the no way conditions. And indeed, under no way conditions, the difference between the two sites is basically zero. So indeed, yes, I can confirm that this is truly due to the turbine. And so I'm shading in blue here, all the cases where there is a reduction in the speed at the site that is affected by the wake. And as you can see, all of them have it. So no matter what, you're gonna have a reduction in speed when the site is under the wake. What about other properties? Well, U star, which is our proxy for um, uh, turbulence, especially vertical mixing, because it's so sensitive to W prime, all of them, the majority of them, except one case, had the same um, finding, which is a reduction in, in friction velocity once the wake hits that site. And if you put these two together, the speed is reduced and the friction velocity is reduced. It's not that absurd because we know that uh, turbulence in general is somewhat associated with the wind speed. So it's very hard to think of a phenomenon that can cause a reduction in speed and at the same time, an increase in turbulence. It's, it's very hard to put these two things together. And in fact, our findings are that uh, if, if one goes down, the, the other one tends to go down as well. So there's less turbulence be, below the wake indeed. The heat flux W prime T prime here, and it's actually virtual flux, 
is basically unaffected. We couldn't find any strong signals, no matter what, so they're not statistically significant. And then we get to the core of the problem, of the core of the story, which is the change in temperature. And again, just like in the literature, we tended to find warming for the most part, especially it was statistically significant during stable conditions. So it does seem that under stable conditions, at least, there is indeed warming at the ground. In, in, uh, at the same time, there is not an increase, increase in vertical mixing, but if anything, there's actually a reduction in vertical mixing and a reduction in speed. So how can we put these things together? Well, uh, a quick way of looking at this is to think about the production of TKE the production term, which is directly proportional basically to shear. So if you look at the figure here, you have the blue line, which is the undisturbed typical log-log profile. This is a simplified diagram, obviously. And let's say this is the profile upstream of the turbine, and then the red line is the uh, wind speed deficit caused by the, the turbine, which, which looks like a bite, like a bite has been taken out of the, out of the log profile. And because of these uh, wind speed deficit profile, what happens is that below the rotor, actually you can even see it visually, uh, with the log profile, you have a pretty strong downward momentum flux and you have a pretty strong shear. Uh, the two are, are always hand in hand. So the blue line is the downward momentum flux. But after the turbine, the, the shear is actually reduced and the momentum flux also is reduced. And so this doesn't, shouldn't surprise us that uh, turbulence should be less below the rotor because of this wind speed deficit that now we know also from vertex that we have confirmed that indeed the wind speed is reduced under the wake. So if the wind speed is reduced, the shear is reduced, and these uh, momentum fluxes and the production of TKE should be reduced as well. So we're pretty confident about this, um, but the, the cause of the warming is still a little puzzling. So what we looked at to try to understand it was, first of all, we actually looked at local stability. We looked at Mon Moninobukov length from the various um, surface fluxes, and uh, it was actually, there was no clear signal. There's, there was really hard to see any association with the results and the stability. But when we looked at uh, stability using actually the lapse rate at the MET tower that we had, which as you may remember, goes up to 49 meters. If, so if we take a look at a more like boundary layer oriented type of lapse rate, and I call it rotor lapse rate, even though it doesn't exactly reach, it doesn't reach across the rotor because the tower is only a 49 meter. But uh, I think actually if you can go through the rotor, it will be even better. What seems to be driving or be correlated with the temperature changes is stability calculated this way. So it doesn't matter what local is going on in the marsh, what local is going on below the rotor, excuse me, below the wake. It doesn't matter what happens near the ground. What really matters is what happens around the rotor. Because in this figure, I'm showing you that depending on what this rotor lapse rate is, uh, there is a actually pretty neat correlation with the observed changes in temperature. So I didn't draw a line here because actually I don't know if I should do a straight line, a fit that is more like some kind of a hockey stick, but definitely when the atmosphere is stable, as the stability increases, definitely the warming does as well. When it's neutral, it's kind of like a little bit of a mess. The points are all over the place, but on average, if you take the average of these, there's maybe a touch of warming uh, or, or no warming at all. And then when it's unstable, and unfortunately we didn't have very many cases, it seems like the, the, the effect is actually cooling. So now we know that there has to be something that these, these temperature effects are related to the lower boundary layer stability. And so now we finally have a potential theory which is that what matters is not what the heat flux does, because we know that the heat flux is actually not really affected much. Um, it doesn't matter what the turbulence does, and we know that it's actually decreasing. It's possible and plausible that what matters is whether there is convergence or, or divergence of the heat fluxes. So what I'm showing you here is a, is a simplified example for a stable condition. 
and I have a case where it's, uh, um, you know, it's stable throughout the green line and a case where it's actually very stable, um, very stable first and um, um, less stable uh, aloft. So two, two different cases and um, for, for potential temperature. And so here's the turbine. And from what we know now, we know that there's a lot of turbulence in the upper part of the rotor, some in the lower part, but not nearly as much as in the upper part. So if this turbulence indeed, um, this turbulence in the upper part of the turbine for sure enhances the mix, the, the fluxes, that turbulence is a lot. So if you look at these upstream heat flux, let's say the blue line, just, just for the sake of reasoning, this is upstream. Now there's all this turbulence in the upper wake. Downstream, this flux is definitely enhanced because there is so much turbulence. So now you have a flux that was small and now it's very large. And by contrast, upstream at the ground, the, the heat flux hasn't really changed much, but the flux coming down here is huge compared to what it was before. So what happens is that in the wake, you get more convergence and therefore warming. So this has actually been discovered by other researchers. They found a lot of warming at, at hub height, and uh, we believe this is the mechanism. But if you go below the hub, uh, below the wake, it's the same because there's still some turbulence in the, uh, in the wake. So the flux upstream versus downstream is still enhanced in the lower part of the wake, but the flux at the surface is not, so you get more convergence and warming. What happens in unstable conditions? Well, we can look at the same story. Uh, the fluxes now are upwards because it's unstable. And uh, I mean, you can look at a bunch of cases, but the story is the same. The fluxes that are in the wake are enhanced. The fluxes at the surface are not. And so you can get actually an enhancement of the divergence and therefore cooling below the wake uh, when the atmosphere is unstable. And then the, the more difficult case of all, which is the neutral conditions, uh, I'm showing you a couple here. So in principle, there's no change if the atmosphere is truly, truly, completely neutral all the way up. Then there's no changes, you know, there's no heat flux to start with. You can have a lot of turbulence, but there's no heat flux to enhance, so it's not going to cause any change. But if you are maybe, if the atmosphere is neutral up to a certain level, and, and then it starts being slightly stable, uh, in the in the rotor in the rotor region, then even just tiny little st uh, stable layer, which causes a little bit of downward flux, that downward flux in is enhanced, and now you can get a little bit of convergence below the rotor again. So this is how we can actually explain how there could be some warming in neutral conditions below the rotor. How do we prove this? Well, unfortunately, as you may remember from the layout of vertex, which I want to show you one more time. We do have a MET tower, but the MET tower is upstream of the turbine. So if we want to look at any kind of vertical, uh, the, the vertical flux divergence, we need a MET tower and the MET tower is upstream. So we had to basically um, look at cases, those few cases where maybe there were some southwesterly flow that would hit the turbine first and then go to the MET tower and then we would have some, some, some cases. And it was not easy. We didn't have any surface fluxes to, to uh, help us, well, but we did have some lidars to, to help us identify. So here's an example of one of the few examples that we could find about this heat flux divergence. And again, it's the difference between the heat flux measured at 49 meters of the tower versus the heat flux at 10 meters divided by delta Z gives the divergence and it's as a function of time, and it's the black line. And this, this is a case that was very stable. The red line shows you the, the lapse rate, positive, and there's actually an inversion. And uh, the flow is from the southwest, and the, um, the divergence is positive to start with, as, as we're expecting under stable conditions. And then when the wake actually hits the, the, uh, the MET tower, boom, the divergence plummets. This is the square is when the wake hits the, the SED tower, the, the MET tower. The divergence becomes negative, which is convergence, and it stays 
negative through the whole time that the wake hits the it's the met tower and then here is when the wake is over it, it quickly goes back to a slightly positive value so this was just super cool because we could confirm that indeed there was this convergence of the fluxes actually happening at the met tower unfortunately we, we had very few cases like this how are we doing with time okay i can still go <laughs> Um, so what we decided to do was, uh, we, what we planned to do was to use obviously a simulation, a simulation to have uh, a better idea of what's happening. And uh, first we wanted to do large eddy simulation because it gives us a lot of details of the wake, especially below the rotor. But the problem is that the uh, vertex site is very, very moist. We're in a marsh in the summertime and the lack of any kind of uh, um, uh, treatment for water vapor and uh, you know the moist stability that we had was actually a, a big problem in addition to that the, the code that we have been using you kind of either specify a temperature change at the surface or you specify a heat flux it's not coupled with a real ground model so since here we are so sensitive to what happens to the ground and the heat fluxes and the, their convergence and the feedback with temperature we felt like having a dry LES with no ground model, no surface layer was not going to work. So at first we switched to WARF with the fit parameterization and uh, we wanted to use that. But unfortunately, we found a bug in the code. And I kind of want to talk about it here because you guys are at NCAR and so you should be aware of this. And uh, uh, the paper is actually almost, uh, uh, almost accepted for uh, publication in monthly weather review. And we have already submitted the bug fix through GitHub. It's already been accepted, uh, but I wanna share it with you in case, that, uh, in case you've been using this parameterization because it will, it will probably affect your results. So the Fitch parameterization is this very, um, uh, is the default parameterization in WARF to treat wind farms or wind turbines for that matter. And uh, the way it works is that there's a code called, uh, subroutine called module wind fitch, which does all the calculations of the extraction of kinetic energy, the addition of, ki of turbulent kinetic energy by the turbines, and feeds it back to the, to, the main, um, to the main wharf. There is one variable that is used to, uh, to, uh, to predict the turbulence kin turbulent kinetic energy, which is QKE. QKE is actually twice TKE. That's the variable that uh, is updated by the presence of the farms. And this is a local variable. QKE is, uh, is, uh, it gets updated by the Fitch parameterization in its default uh, formulation. And um, it, it's, a, it's a subgrid process. So uh, this QKE that is predicted at the grid cells where the farm is, is only remains basically where the farm is. And it cannot be advected around because it's basically not visible to the rest of the domain. This is the default. And obviously this is not good for the, for the wind community because we wanna see what happens to the TKE being advected downwind. We wanna see wakes, right? So a modification of, wharf, uh, of the Fitch parameterization was introduced uh, uh, some six years ago or so where there is an option to advect TKE around after it's formed. And it's through a flag, which is called uh, BLMYNN TKE advect. So you can set that flag to true, and in principle, you should get TKE to be advected around. But unfortunately, it's not. It does not get advected because there is this bug by which the, the uh, the scalar variable that should be advected around, it's called QKE ADV. This QKE ADV, which is the one that you really want to update because you will see the wake, it's, it's initialized right before the call to the Fitch parameterization. In the Fitch parameterization, the local variable is QKE and there is no update back to QKE ADV. So QKE ADV basically never gets updated with the value of the QKE added by the farm. And so we found this bug, we fixed it, we added basically this step by which after the QKE has been added by the Fitch parameterization, you do update the, the scalar, global scalar QKE ADV so it can finally be advected around properly. So 
This was the first bug, and I want to show you some of the effects of this bug. So here is what happens when you have a single turbine in the center of the domain of Wharf here. It's a 40 kilometer by 40 kilometer domain at one kilometer resolution, and I'm zooming in to a few grid cells so that you can actually see the values because it's kind of important to see uh, that some of the values are actually identical in some of these runs. This is the default formulation where this flag that I mentioned, B-L-M-I-N-N-T-K-E at VECT is equal to zero. And it's not the recommended version, excuse me, the recommended um, way to run uh, the Fitch parameterization. Because as you can see here, the, the, there's basically the TKE that is created in the farm remains in the farm. There is no sign whatsoever of any wake being advected. And that's, that's exactly why the, uh, the, this flag was introduced, so that you could actually advect it around. And so when you do, what happens here, there's obviously something is happening. The, the TKE at the farm is less. So something has happened. Something must have been advected, but there really doesn't seem to be awake. Some of the values are slightly higher here than they were here, but this is nothing near what awake should do. And... Um, so I want to show you what happens if you run the same simulation exactly the same with that same flag, but you set this variable CTKE, which is a um, parameter that controls how much TKE the wind farm generates, you impose it to be zero. So there is a turbine in that, in that grid cell. It does cause a wind speed deficit, but it does not produce any turbulence. You just shut down the turbulence production. So if you can spend this time, control it for, check it for yourself, you will see that downstream of this, this turbine, the values are exactly the same as they are in this case, which means the only difference is what happens at the farm, obviously. At the farm here, there is the TKE that was generated at the, at the grid cell. Here, there isn't because it's been suppressed. But downstream, the situation is exactly the same, which is a proof that there is indeed a bug. There should be a difference between these two cases, but there isn't. So when you do fix the bug, which is what we do down here in case four, finally, we see a wake. We see a higher value of TKE, though, 1.35. Is this high or, or is this low? It's actually too high. But at least we see a wake that is developing downwind and it's impacting several uh, grid cells downstream. So this seems to be headed the right direction, but TKE is too high. And we know this because we compared against some LES results that we tried to average in, a, in the horizontal, uh, average over squares that were the same size as the wharf, the wharf grid cells. So in this case, the turbine is located here. It's the same model and the same characteristics as the turbine in Wharf. It's the NREL 5 megawatts. And we average in this square, which is a one kilometer by one kilometer square, and the average of the added TKE is 0 0.9 square meter per second. So we know that 1.35 is too much. And so what we tried was, can we maybe fix the, the TKE original, the original formulation of CTKE, in such a way that it's actually 25% of what it was, a quarter of its original value. And when you do that, you actually get a reasonable value for the grid cell of the turbine, and you do see a wake that forms downstream and, and uh, impacts the, the, the right cells. Um, I have a couple of uh, vertical cross sections again to show you how different the, these results really are. If you don't use that flag, if you, if you run the Fitch parameterization with the default formulation and there is no TK advection whatsoever, basically the way I like to describe this is that the column where the turbine is implode, explodes with TK. It doesn't have anywhere to go. It keeps being pumped in and more and more and more. It can only stretch in the vertical. It can never leave that column. It's crazy. So all the meteorological variables in that column are affected by this insane amount of TKE that gets injected at that grid cell. And guess what? Downstream, there is absolutely nada. No TKE whatsoever coming out of that, of that cell. When you set it to one, now it's completely different. The cross-section is completely different. There is this bump because there is indeed extra TKE being generated. Uh, but if you compare downstream of the turbine, so to the right of the, of the 
let's say to the right of two kilometers. This case and this case, they are identical down to the fifth decimal point, which really means that even though the flag is on, even though the TKE should be a vectored around, it actually isn't. It is not a vectored around. The, the only TKE that is put in here is basically the one from the last time step. Then when we fix the bug, then that, that it, it works. I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously um, much more realistic. The, the TKEs are vectored around, but it's too much. So this value is actually, it's not a value, it's actually a parameter that is calculated by difference of other values, but the formulation is too much, it's too high. And so when we actually fix the bug and reduce TKE, uh, the CTKE to a quarter of its original value, we finally get profiles that are reasonable. And here is where I can actually do a comparison more like a, a point by point versus the LES results. The LES results are in black and they are again uh, planar averages over those, the, the square of the, of the wind farm. And uh, the case on the left is actually at, at, the, um, uh, at the location of the, the turbine and the one on the right is one grid point downstream. So you can see that the, the case where the flag is set to zero is case one is literally insane. The amount of TKE is extremely, it, it is unreasonable. And case two, which is the one with the bug, the irony is that it's not bad at all. It actually gives us a TKE profile of turbine, turbine generated TKE that is actually very good to the LES, but for the wrong reasons because it does not advect properly, but because it had such a high value of CTKE, these two compensating errors were actually giving you a TKE profile that was ironically very reasonable. And that's why I believe this bug had not been found before, because if you look at the TKE profile at the farm, it's actually not bad. And instead, when you fix the bug alone, you just fix the bug case four and you don't modify CTKE, you still get a crazy profile. It's way too much TKE, which was also found by other researchers. So we know that if we don't also reduce the CTKE, we don't get reasonable results. And that's what we do with case five, where we have, we have actually fixed the bug and reduced CTKE. Now the profile is now finally uh, in, in good agreement with the LES. And here is what happens one grid downstream. And again, look at case one, how weird it is. You know, at the farm of the, at the uh, turbine grid cell, super high, super crazy. And then one point downstream, absolutely zero. There's no TKE whatsoever. And again, by irony, case four is actually not too bad, uh, one, one grid point downstream, but uh, for the wrong reasons. So we, uh, we propose case five which at least has a good agreement at the, at the farm, and it's not too, too crazy uh, downstream, but it's far from perfect. So basically the, the bug alone uh, has a very complicated effect that depends on, on how you set your uh, BL, MY, and NTK advect plug. And here is a quick summary if you're interested. Uh, so again, it depends if it's true or false and the effects can be either overestimated or underestimated at the grid cell of the farm or of the turbine. And then downstream, it can be unaffected completely or only partially affected by, um, uh, basically there's no real TKE advection from, from the farm, unfortunately. And so in conclusions, <laughs> um, we are kind of confirming that uh, uh, the vertical mixing below a wake is not really enhanced. And this was already um, hinted by a bunch of uh, simulations and uh, quite a few uh, wind tunnel experiments. And now with the vertex field campaign, we, kinda, we kind of confirmed it. The real challenge was to try to understand the surface temperature response, because how can we get warming uh, in, in stable conditions and uh, slight cooling in unstable conditions if there's no changes in the heat fluxes at the surface. And uh, when we don't see really any enhanced turbulence or if anything, we see reduced turbulence. And the idea is that uh, the explanation came once we actually looked at the boundary layer stability. So we have to try to get into the rotor to really understand what's going on. And uh, we also need to understand that 
the wake is a complicated feature, but it seems to have a dual nature, basically. If you talk about the wake as wind speed deficit, then yes, it reaches the ground and very quick, relatively quickly, within like six diameters, the wake deficit, the wind speed deficit hits the ground. But if you talk about the wake as a turbulence, um, enhanced turbulence feature, then it basically ne never reaches the ground. So the wake is turbulent, but only in the upper part of it. And it doesn't seem to be reaching, the turbulence of the wake does not seem to reach the ground. Uh, we have a, a possible explanation for the warming and cooling uh, that, that doesn't rely on the actual value of the heat flux or the uh, um, turbulence. It has to do with the heat flux divergence mechanism. And uh, we want to conduct some, we, we wanted to use WARF to, to verify this mechanism, but uh, because of the bug, we couldn't. And so now we're going to, we just started to do some WARF LES simulations. My student is, is looking at this. And hopefully we can, we can dig into these, uh, these heat flux divergent, divergence mechanism. And obviously we can probably, we, hopefully we can overlap multiple wakes and see what happens in that case. But we are a bit disappointed that uh, it, it, there is basically no way to treat wakes really correctly in, in, in numerical models, in, in uh, like mesoscale models like WARF, because basically the only, the only grid point where we make an intervention to parameterize the farm is the farm. And unfortunately, the, the wake is a... Um, dynamic feature. It depends on the, the wind shear and the, the deficit caused shear downstream. And so if we don't model that, then with just, with just a modification of what happens at one grid cell, we're not going to be able to get the proper TKE and the proper wake uh, represented in the model. So this is going to be a little bit of a challenge that uh, we, should, uh, we should think about for the future. Yeah, that's, that's, that's all I have. And I didn't lose power and uh, there's no wind left outside. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for this um, very interesting presentation. And I already have the first question for you, sure. which is from Tim Doolan. And he writes, um, interesting talk, lay person questions. <laughs> oh so no, those are the hardest. <laughs> <laughs> So is the conclusion that slight warming is possible near the ground within the wake of a turbine due to mixing of atmospheric layers? And what is the extent of the warming in degrees C? And what's, what is the extent of the wake, like the distance in our area? Obviously dependent on conditions and the turbine, but just a general idea. Yeah. So, um... The, uh, here is a little figure that maybe helps you quantify. I didn't really talk about how many degrees. The warming is very small. So I don't want you to think of like, you know, something of great concern. Uh, on average, like in this case, let's say 0 0.2 degrees Celsius under stable conditions. Um, actually, I have a table. I thought I had a table. Let's see. Where is it? Yeah. Um, on average, 0 0.18 was the average under stable conditions uh, for certain sites, 0 0.07, 0 0.04. These are very small average changes. Um, in fact, they are about the same magnitude as some kind of normal variability that, that we found in the marsh. So in terms of magnitude, they are small, but these are significant. So even though they are the same magnitude and, as some normal variability, these are a, a very specific and statistically significant signal, uh, but, but small. So the real problem, I think the real question is what happens, this is a single turbine, right? So, you know, you get 0 0.18 degrees of warming under stable conditions, which happen, you know, uh, in the summertime in Delaware, 20% of the time, maybe, you know, it tends to be neutral a lot. Uh, no, maybe more than 20, like maybe 20 to 40% of the time. Um, so nothing really super concerning. What happens if now you have 100 turbines, right? Uh, th that, that's more like the interesting uh, question to try to answer, and I don't have an answer for you. A lot of people have looked at a lot of values um, from satellites and so on and so forth. 
simulations. Now, any simulation with WARF, I'm not going to believe because I know that there's this bug. So literally, I, I cannot believe any simulation results on temperature and any kind of wake effects that has to do with the feature parameterization because of this bug. So that cuts out like half of the publications already. And uh, I would say the highest value that I've ever seen was like 1.5 degrees of warming with a bunch of assumptions on how that was calculated. So it's not, it's not a lot. Um, and also keep in mind that uh, this is a warming that is dynamically induced. So as soon as the wake moves, the warming is gone. And as soon as the turbine stops, the warming is gone. And as soon as the stability changes, the warming is gone. So it's not like a permanent uh, uh, long lasting warming like CO2 would do. So CO2 keeps causing the greenhouse gas effect even 70 years after it's gone. So it has this uh, very uh, long lasting effect. This is going on as long as there is a wake. So when the wake moves away, or the wake is shut down because there's no wind or the turbine is off or after 20 years, the farm is decommissioned, that is gone as well. And then what was the other question? The value of the temperature change and how long the wakes are. Yeah, exactly, yeah. area. Yes, so um, if you want like a back of the, uh, like a, a quick calculation, I wanna say, if you have a turbine, ask what the diameter of the turbine is, and then multiply by 10. That's about how long a wake is. If the atmosphere is stable, that wake tends to be longer, so it can be like 15 diameters. I think if you want to use a number that you're absolutely certain that there will never be a wake, you can use 20 diameters. After 20 diameters, there's, there's no wake. If the atmosphere is unstable, it's even shorter. So the wake could be gone, but gone by like eight diameters. So I think 10, 12, something like that is a good back of the envelope calculation for a single turbine. But when you have a lot of them, when you have a farm, that's where it kind of gets complicated because you have rows and columns of, 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 of turbines, right? So the diameter of one is not really that important. You kind of have to look at what's the size of the farm. And that's where I don't really have a good back of the envelope calculation. But I would say that if you have a farm of a size L, you know, some kind of a width or length, some length scale of the farm L, within like five L's, most of the wake is gone. Something like that. So if your farm is 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers, within 500 kilometers, the wake is gone. Very back of the envelope. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so while we wait for more questions, I get to ask one of my own. Good. Um, <laughs> so you said you had only um, a very limited number of cases during vertex where you could test your hypotheses of the convergence and divergence. And you were also not too happy with the capabilities of the models. And so now, of course, I have to ask, are you thinking about going back into the field, maybe to a different location to measure this again? To be honest, it was uh, not. <laughs> so I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a modeler, right? And I love the idea of being involved in a field campaign. It was actually not my first field campaign. It was my third field campaign, but definitely the one in which I was involved the most. I mean, it was my campaign, my baby, right? And it was such a hard thing to do. So many things. I, I wish I had known so many things before doing the campaign than I did after. For example, uh, I would say that half of the sites were completely useless. They were just too far. They never were hit by the wake. We shouldn't have put them where we did. And by contrast, we should have put way more um, surface flux stations closer to the turbine. And the LIDARs should have been positioned in a different way. This is something that I learned also from the review process of our papers. Uh, I mean, I didn't, I didn't do the LIDARs myself. I had, I had partners to do this, but uh, some of the way the LIDARs were set up were just not right for the questions that we wanted to ask. So they should have been put in a different position. And, you know, 
the data processing, the, 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 it, it, you, you see the signals are small. We're looking at, you know, 0 0.04 degrees. You know, we had to do so much data processing, data analysis, check everything a million times. It was just like super painful. So, I mean, now I think I, I would know how to do it better. So maybe I should do another one, but it was an exhausting process. It was a very tough process. And at the end of the day, most people are like, well, but this is a single turbine, so who cares? And so I feel like I've done all this work and it's like, who cares? Because that's true. What you want to know is what happens over multiple, after multiple wakes have overlapped. So if I were to do it again, I would probably try to go to a farm. And uh, yeah, and, and I, I would spend a lot of time designing the campaign uh, as carefully as possible. Not that it wasn't carefully designed, don't take me wrong, but I didn't expect the wake to be so meandering I didn't expect the local turbulence and the local stability to not matter. So I had designed everything in such a way that, oh, I measure one site and that tells me the stability of the entire marsh. And pretty much every site had a different sign of the heat flux. It had its own stability. It was so messy. So now I would have definitely a big met tower with super going through the rotor so I could get some measurements inside the, the rotor. And uh, yeah, but not anytime soon. <laughs> Well, maybe some someone who is listening today will go Ooh, out okay. and, do <laughs> and tap into your experience. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I did not get any more questions. Okay. So with that, I would like to thank you again for giving a presentation in the middle of a hurricane. <laughs> I, don't, I think that's a first. No kidding, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you very much. And My pleasure. And we'll be goodbye. able to yeah. in car uh, very soon. Yeah.